Hello everyone and welcome to the second track of Centric Tech Event 2021. I'm Vlad and together with Cosmin, we will be your hosts this evening. This event is delivered by Centric, which is a Dutch company with headquarters in 10 European countries. In Romania, Centric has one of its software development offices where more than 300 experts are building the products for multiple areas like the Dutch public sector, supply chain, HR and payroll, infrastructure and XR. We will be together for the next two hours and to make sure you don't leave without answer to your questions, we have allocated enough time for the QA session. Please write your questions in the chat and after the presentation is done, our guest is more than happy to respond to them. And now I want to let Cosmin tell you some interesting things about the software uh, development discipline in Centric and also about the event. Cosmin. Thank you, Vlad, uh, for the introduction. First of all, hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, suppose you're curious about what we do in Centric when it comes to the software development discipline. Uh, I can briefly tell you that we deliver web, desktop and mobile applications with uh, various technologies and mainly from the Microsoft stack. Our work covers innovation and in all aspects of the development lifecycle. We also like to invest in the education, technical guidance and career growth of our colleagues and many of our former interns are today senior developers, architects or technical leads. This evening, we're very happy to introduce our special guest, Vladimir Korikov, author of Unit Testing Principle Practices and Patterns. He published multiple popular courses and articles about domain-driven design, functional programming and enterprise software development patterns. To make a long story short, we invite you to discover how domain-driven design fits in a nutshell. Vladimir, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I have a... Yes, we can hear. Okay. Yeah, let me share my screen. So, yeah, um, today we are going to discuss the topic of domain driven design in a nutshell. And the, well, uh, in domain driven design, there are quite a lot of topics, and it might be hard to differentiate. Um, the most important of them and it might be also hard to pinpoint the topics that you need uh, to start learning with and the goal of this talk is to discuss the most important principles in domain driven design and uh, also show you how you can start using them in your own projects that's what we're going to do today couple uh, words about myself. As you already know, I have several courses on Pure Site, mostly about domain driven design, and I also have the book about unit testing. All right, so um, the agenda for today's talk are, is going to be uh, first, we are going to discuss the main principles of domain driven design, then we'll talk about anemic versus rich domain models. Next, we will talk about domain model purity. And then finally, we are going to discuss the so-called DDD trilemma. So the main principles in domain driven design, what are they? There are three of them. The first one is bounded context. The second one is ubiquitous language. And the third one is focusing on the domain model, on the core domain. Let's discuss them uh, one by one. The first one is bounded context. When you start a new project, this project itself has two sides to it. The first one is the problem space, and that is everything related to the knowledge about the problem that you're going to solve or about the task that you're going to tackle with your software. So that's the first side. And the second side is the solution space. And the solution space is everything about the code that you're going to write to solve this problem. And you can subdivide the problem into pieces and those pieces are called subdomains. Uh, for example, if you are developing a system for, uh, let's say, selling some online software, then you will have multiple subdomains to that system. For example, booking subdomain, and then sales support and so on and so forth. Uh, 
you can also subdivide the solution space, so the code that you're writing to solve your uh, problem. And these parts that you will have as a result of that subdivision are called bounded contexts. Ideally, you should uh, have this structure where one, where each bounded context tackles one particular subdomain. So the relation between your bounded contexts and your subdomains should be one to one. Inside of those bounded contexts, each of them will have a domain model and that domain model shouldn't intersect with other domain models. And the domain model itself or just model is a system of abstractions that represent some select aspects of the domain. So those aspects that you are going to tackle with your software. And the bounded context, you can see it as a scope in which some particular domain model is consistent. And why do you need such a separation? The main goal of such a separation is to simplify the development process, because without such a separation over time, your code tends to degrade into a big ball of mud and spaghetti code. And with such a separation, you may focus on different parts of your software, develop them in isolation from other parts, and this way you will achieve high cohesion inside the bounded context and loose coupling between bounded contexts. And it should also be noted that this separation into bounded contexts, it's about logical separation. It's not about physical one. So uh, these two parts, logical and physical uh, segregation of your software, they should be tackled independently. For example, you can decide to deploy all your bounded contexts into one large executable, let's say a large MVC web application, or you can decide to put each bounded context, uh, bounded context into its own executable, and that will bring you closer to the uh, microservices architecture. And that brings us to the topic of bounded contexts and microservices. So, um, what separation, how should you segregate your application physically, not just logically in bounded context, but physically? There are several options here, and uh, the first one is the modular monolith. It's when you, as I said, when you decide to deploy all your bounded contexts into one large executable, and that executable is going to be a monolith, and uh, whether or not it's a modular, modular monolith will depend on uh, how well your code is structured inside of that executable. So if your code, um, if your bounded contexts have clear boundaries, then it's going to be a modular, modular monolith. And there is nothing wrong in having a monolith as long as the, its code is well structured. Another uh, legitimate approach here is the microservices architecture. In the microservices architecture, you will have uh, this separation where you deploy one bounded context into its own uh, executable. And this executable is called a microservice. And this is the consensus in uh, the, well, uh, that most people have when uh, in terms of how to separate your um, application into microservices. They shouldn't be too large and they shouldn't be too small. Uh, and one bounded context is a perfect fit, usually a perfect fit for a single microservice. We also have a couple more options and those are anti-patterns. So let's discuss those. The first anti-pattern here is a bad monolith. So it's a monolith that doesn't have clear boundaries between bounded contexts and uh, that, um, well, which is not clear, uh, well structured. Uh, for example, you have some uh, badly uh, structured code in it, badly written code. It doesn't have clear boundaries between bounded contexts. So that uh, shouldn't be the case. You should always have clear boundaries regardless of how you deploy your code. Even if it's a monolith, you still should have uh, clearly defined boundaries between different bounded contexts in your application. Another anti-pattern here is a distributed monolith. So it's when you uh, 
have not one but several executables for a single bounded context so several microservices for a single bounded context and this approach is bad it's an anti-pattern because it combines the drawbacks of both the monolith and the microservices architecture and it doesn't have the benefits of uh, any of them so um, the way to differentiate between a good uh, microservices architecture and bad microservices architecture, so the so-called distributed monolith, is uh, the following rule. It's to ask yourself whether or not you can deploy a single microservice independently from all other of your microservices. If you can deploy it independently from other microservices, then it's a legitimate microservices architecture. And if you cannot do that, if you have to deploy all your microservices together, otherwise they wouldn't work, then it's a distributed monolith. And there is nothing, um, nothing positive about this pattern, about this anti-pattern, uh, because what you are doing here is essentially you are replacing the in-memory calls between different parts of your bounded context with HTTP calls. And that just adds additional latency uh, in your application and also it becomes hard to refactor between, um, uh, it, it becomes hard to refactor the bounded context itself. So don't do that. The best approach here, as I said, is to have one uh, microservice per one bounded context. So let's discuss uh, some examples. This example is from an article from a uh, quite widely known article from Michael uh, Martin Fowler, where he uh, talks about bounded contexts. And in this example, we have two bounded contexts. The first one is the sales context and the second one is the support context. So in the sales context, uh, we are trying to do a sale to our customers and the support context is responsible for uh, tickets, for support requests and so on. If you, um, so here, as you can see, there are some intersections between these two bounded contexts. Both of these contexts have the customer entity and both of them also have the product entity. It's rarely the case that you will not have any intersections between your bounded contexts. Uh, um, like for example, here with the customer and the product entity, but still if if even if uh, both of these bounded contexts have uh, same entities, you shouldn't reuse the code between them because that would lead to, uh, to uh, high coupling between your bounded contexts. And as I said previously, the main reason why you are introducing bounded contexts is to decouple your code so that you can work on different bounded contexts independently from each other. And uh, the only way to achieve this decoupling is to duplicate your code between these bounded contexts. So these uh, two areas, these two bounded contexts, sales and support, they should have their own versions of this customer class. Um, some of these code will be duplicated and some of these code uh, will be unique for each of these bounded contexts. And even if you have some duplication between these two classes in these two bounded contexts, there is nothing wrong with that duplication because uh, despite the fact that the entity itself is the same, uh, both of these uh, bounded contexts work with the same customer, they look at this customer from different angles. So here, for example, sales context looks at the customer from the point of view of how, how to do a sale to that customer, whereas the support context looks at the same customer from the point of view of how to make his life easier with the software that was sold to that customer by the sales bounded context. So these two bounded contexts have different goals and you shouldn't mix these two responsibilities together because otherwise, um, and it will become hard to understand what exactly this piece of code does. And um, your code will become more complex and it will uh, trend toward the big bowl of mud, sp spaghetti code, code and other anti-patterns. <clears throat> 
And um, note that it's not only the duplication at the class level that you should do here, but also uh, duplication at the database level. So both of these bounded contexts should have different uh, classes for the customer um, concept. And also they both should have different tables for the customer entity. So if you are working with a monolith, then uh, monolith that has just a single database, then you should have two different tables for the customer for each of these bounded contexts. The customer for the sales context and the customer table for the support context. And of course, if you have, uh, if you work with the microservices architecture, architecture then you will also have uh, these two, um, uh, you will also have two different tables for the uh, customer entity because they will reside in different databases. And um, so the uh, two customers here, um, they will, uh, they may have different attributes, but they also may have the same ones, the same attributes. It's just you need to have a clear understanding of which context is responsible for which aspects or attributes of the entity. And that context would become the master context for uh, this particular set of attributes. Only that uh, bounded context will be able to change those attributes. So for example, uh, let's say that in this particular case, sales context is responsible for identity of the customer because, uh, uh, because the customer gets created when you do the first sale to that customer. And, uh, and, and it means that the sales context is responsible for creating those customers and also for assigning the identity, the ID to that customer. And also uh, the sales context may be responsible for other fields, for example, customer name or customer email. Next, those attributes such as customer ID, name and so on uh, may get synchronized to the support context because the support context needs to know about this customer in order to provide uh, the support to that customer. So let's say that the support customer uh, context uh, syncs the customer ID and the customer name. And these uh, bounded context may add additional attributes on top of those attributes that it copies from the sales context. For example, it may add the support level such as gold, silver or bronze uh, to the customer. And this support level may be stored in the support custom, uh, context only, but it may also be synchronized back to the sales context if the sales context needs those attributes to do its work. For example, if it needs uh, to know the, uh, uh, the support level to do some upselling for that customer to that customer. It's just uh, you need to have a clear deline uh, delineation, a clear separation of which context is responsible for which attributes. Here in this example, the sales context will be responsible for the ID of the customer and for the customer name, and uh, which means that only that context will be able to change the customer name. And uh, the support context may copy those attributes to uh, its own database, but it will not be able to change those attributes. And the other way around as well, the support context here will be responsible for the support level, which may be synchronized back to the sales context, but the, sale con the sales context will not be able to change the support level. And this delineation, this separation is important to avoid merge conflicts. It's when both of these bounded contexts modify the same customer and the same attribute in them, and then it becomes hard to understand uh, how to do the merge between these two modifications. All right, so that was the first uh, of the three main principles, and that is bounded context. Uh, the second principle in domain driven design is ubiquitous language. Ubiquitous language is the common language for programmers and domain experts. The goal of having this common ubiquitous language is to simplify the communication inside the team between the programmers and also between the programmers and the customer. It's often the case that when uh, developers when, when programmers develop the software, they use their own terminology to describe the terms 
for that software. And when they go to, uh, when they discuss something with domain experts, they will translate their terms into the terms that the domain experts may understand. And when they go back to the uh, programmers team, they will do the backward translation. And so this constant translation adds the communication barrier. Uh, which leads to additional maintenance overhead because you will have to constantly think about uh, two versions of the same term in your head. And so uh, the goal of the ubiquitous language is to re remove this gap between uh, this communication gap between developers and experts. So that both of you, uh, both of these two groups, uh, programmers and domain experts, both of them should use the same language when talking about the software. <laughs> also, ubiquitous language requires active maintenance and refactoring. It means that you need to remove duplicates or synonyms and constantly work with domain experts to improve the terminology. For example, if you notice that you, are, uh, you and domain experts use two different terms to describe the same concept, for example, user and customer, then you need to bring this question up and ask domain experts to use just one term to describe the, this concept, for example, not, not a user, but a customer. And that will clean the, uh, uh, the ubiquitous language. Also, you need to maintain the code, the domain model in synchronization with your uh, ubiquitous language. Uh, so you will have this picture where on one hand you will have uh, the domain model, so the model that you as a programmer develop, and on the other hand you will have the picture, uh, uh, you will have the understanding of that domain model in the domain expert's heads. And you will, you as a programmer need to keep these two areas in sync. So it means that if you decide, if you agree to rename user into customer, you need to also do the same in your own code. So rename the user class into the customer class. And also do that not only at the code level, but at the database level as well. So if you decide to do this renaming, you also need to rename the uh, user table so that it also conforms to the ubiquitous language. You need to rename it from the user uh, table to the customer table. And uh, the ubiquitous language itself is part of the bounded context. Uh, the ubiquitous language is the language that is used to uh, develop your domain model. So your domain model, uh, for example, classes and methods or attributes in those classes, they should be uh, developed using ubiquitous language. And as I said earlier, each bounded context has its own domain model, which means that each bounded context will have its own ubiquitous language. And uh, there is also an, um, an interesting topic of the DSLs. DSL is a domain-specific language. It's a language that uh, specific for some particular uh, domain, uh, some particular problem domain. And what's the difference between um, ubiquitous language in the DDD sense and such a DSL? DSL is essentially a ubiquitous language brought to an extreme. The difference between the two is that with the DSL, you are creating your own programming language. You're creating uh, your own, uh, you're writing your own compiler for that language. Whereas with a typical ubiquitous language, you are inserting your domain terms into the existing programming language. And both of these approaches have their own uh, benefits and drawbacks. So uh, with the regular ubiquitous language, the drawback here is that when you develop your domain model, you're not just using the uh, ubiqu ubiquitous language to develop that domain model. Uh, you're also using the terms from the programming language that you're using. For example, in C Sharp, when you're writing the customer class, you're not only using the term customer, but you also need to use um, words such as public, class, and then curly braces, and so on and so forth. And those uh, terms, they are not they don't belong to the ubiquitous language. They add some additional noise to your domain model. Uh, 
Whereas in the DSL, because you can write it from scratch and you do write it from scratch, you're able to remove all that noise and only focus on the ubiquitous language itself without any additional uh, distractions and any additional noise. The drawback of the DSL is that you will have to spend quite significant effort on creating that DSL and then maintaining it because once again, uh, it's essentially a different programming language because you will need to write your own compiler for that uh, programming language. And by default, I just uh, usually recommend to stick to the typical ubiquitous language that you can use with uh, languages like C Sharp, Java and so on. That's enough for most cases. A DSL is um, too large of an effort and it's not justified in most uh, applications. All right, so that was the second main principle of domain driven design, uh, um, ubiquitous language. The third principle is focusing on the domain model. And that's the part that we'll discuss in this talk in more detail later. The domain model is the cornerstone of your application. And when you develop, uh, when you start developing your application, you need to start with your domain model. You can often see that uh, people start the development of an application with the database. For example, um, well, uh, they create the database and they create some tables in that database, put some columns, store procedures, and so on and so forth. Then they uh, create the database access layer on top of that database, and then business logic, API, UI, and so on. And that is called inside out development. And uh, this is not the best approach to start the development of a new project. The better approach is the so called middle out development. And why it's called this way? That's because if you represent your application as an onion uh, with uh, two layers, uh, in the center of that layer of that onion, you will have the business logic or your domain model. And uh, it means that this domain model doesn't depend on anything other than itself. And on top of that domain model, on top of that business logic, you will have additional layers such as the application layer, the infrastructure layer, and so on and so forth. And so uh, this Anion uh, structure, this Anion architecture, it shows the flow of dependencies in your application. It means that uh, higher levels, um, higher level layers may depend on layers below them, but the lower level layers do not refer to the higher level layers. So here, for example, the application layer can and should depend on the domain model, but the domain model shouldn't know anything about the external layers. And this way, uh, you will be able to start your development with the domain model and then start uh, and then uh, orchestrate it with the application services layer, the UI, and so on. Also, your domain logic must have an explicit place in your code base, and that place should be separated from all other parts of the project's code. Uh, you can often see the situation where um, your domain model takes up a small portion of a lot of layers in your application. For example, uh, your domain logic, part of it may reside in stored procedures, part of that may reside in the UI, in the implementation layer, in the abstraction layer, and so on. And that is not a good way to, um, to model your domain because it becomes hard to maintain such a domain model. Your domain model should always have a uh, clearly separate, um, clearly defined place in your code base, and it should also have a clear boundaries uh, between uh, your domain model and all other parts of your application. And here, um, a good example of not focusing on the uh, domain model would be the use of out of the box systems such as ERPs such as, for example, SAP or Microsoft Dynamics. These out-of-the-box systems, these um, ERP systems, they are good for generic subdomains, but they are bad for core subdomains. Generic subdomain is a subdomain that is, well, it is important for your application, but it's not the uh, 
part of your application that brings a competitive advantage to your company. So, for example, if you develop, uh, let's say, um, an air, uh, a system that um, help, helps your company to sell software, then a part of that system would be a booking subdomain. And so uh, for that subdomain, you shouldn't write code yourself because it's a solved problem and you will find a lot of these already existing solutions for that uh, problem that you can integrate with. So, uh, and here, uh, good, Solutions would be something like SAP or Microsoft Dynamics. So they would be a good solution for these generic subdomains, but they will not be a good solution for core subdomains. And that's because uh, the core subdomain is the most important part of your application. And uh, it's never the case, you, you will never uh, have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the requirements that your business people have to this core subdomain and the functionality that these uh, ERP systems provide you. You will always have some dis discrepancies. For example, uh, you will have um, some entities that are pretty close to what your domain experts want, what your stakeholders want, but not exactly the same. And so you will have this uh, reintroduction of the communication barrier between developers and domain experts because developers will have to work with what uh, is existing with these systems, with in these ERP systems. Uh, whereas it's not exactly, it wouldn't be exactly the same that uh, the stakeholders want. And also uh, in such pre-existing systems, you will have a lot of functionality that your company doesn't need, but you will have to still maintain that functionality because, uh, well, it's already there. And so the course, uh, the core domain, uh, the uh, the code that you write for the core core subdomain, it should always be custom development that you write from scratch by hand. You shouldn't outsource these. Uh, responsibility to, um, well, anywhere outside your company and especially to uh, out-of-the-box systems like existing ERP systems. All right, so that's the first part, uh, the main principles of domain-driven design. There are three of them. The first one is bounded context, uh, the second one is ubiquitous language, and the third one is uh, focus on the domain model. Let's now discuss the uh, what exactly uh, are the attributes of a good domain model. One of the most important attributes of a good domain model is each richness, so to speak. So um, uh, there is this distinction between anemic and a rich domain model. And that's, um, well, what, what is an anemic domain model? An anemic domain model is when you separate your classes into two types. First type is classes that contain data, and the second type are classes that contain operations that work upon that data. And that's that would be uh, uh, an anemic domain model. The problem with, um, yeah, and let's, let's take a look at this. And this example. So here we have um, a person class that contains some data about the person uh, name, email, and whether or not this person is an employee in the company. And we also have some uh, person service that contains operations upon uh, that person class. The problem with anemic domain models is that it doesn't restrict the changes that you do in your domain entities. So um, you will have to always make sure that the modifications that you do, uh, they don't lead to inconsistencies in your, in your data. For example, here, it could be the case that your email, when you modify your email, you need to look at the domain part of that email. And if that domain part corresponds, coincides with the domain of your company, then you need to mark this person as an employee. So that could be a business rule in your application. But because the person class uh, is fully open, it has public setters, it's impossible for this person uh, class to uh, impose this restriction. And so you will always have to keep in mind uh, these 
um, you will always have to keep in mind what is and what isn't possible to do with that class and that adds additional cognitive load and which uh, leads to uh, well it may lead to uh, increasing uh, it will it will increase the possibility of bugs in your application on the other hand a rich domain model is a domain model that doesn't allow you to do anything with it that would lead to data inconsistencies. So a rich domain model is an encapsulated domain model. These are these two are synonyms. And what is encapsulation? There are two uh, main definitions of uh, this notion of the notion um, notion of encapsulation. The first one is that it is information hiding. It's when you hide some properties or methods in your classes uh, from the clients of that class by making them private. So that's the first definition. The second definition is grouping data and logic together. So when you combine these two aspects of your domain model into one class. And these two uh, practices are good practices, but they by themselves are not the definition of the uh, of encapsulation. Encapsulation is an act of protecting your data against inconsistencies. And these two properties are uh, the uh, consequence of having good encapsulated domain model, but they again, they by themselves are not uh, the definition of encapsulation. And so the goal of encapsulation is to make sure that any modifications in your domain model, uh, they don't lead to data inconsistency. They don't lead to invariant violation. And what is an invariant? If we go back to our example with the person class, an invariant here could be that these two properties, the email and the is employee properties, they need to change uh, simultaneously. So they uh, depend on each other. As I said, if you modify the email, then you have to also modify the is employee flag. Um, and um, so why encapsulation is important? It's important because it helps you to reduce the cognitive load. It helps you to alleviate the cognitive space that you need to in order to work with your code because such code encapsulated code will guide you through what is and what isn't allowed to do with that code so that you don't even even have a chance to do anything incorrectly so here you need to uh, always keep in mind that you cannot trust yourself to do the right thing all the time you need to eliminate the very possibility of doing the wrong thing and the best way to do so is to maintain proper encapsulation so that your code base doesn't even provide an option for you to do anything incorrectly. And your domain classes should contain as many invariants as possible. Um, so they should maintain uh, ideally all the invariants that are present in your application. That's not always possible and we'll discuss that later in this talk. So uh, let's take another example of an anemic domain model. So here, for example, we have the customer class with um, some properties, name property, email status, and the list of orders that this customer has in your system and the current discount. The problem with this uh, class is that just by looking at this customer class, it's not clear which operations are uh, legitimate and which operations are not legitimate because all the properties are public all the setters of those properties are public you may change them any way you like but not all of those combinations will be legitimate some of them uh, will and some some of them will not and uh, because of that it takes up the cognitive space when you work with this cloud because you will have to constantly keep in mind um, all those valid combinations of these um, properties. And this in turn increases the risk of a mistake uh, because you will have to uh, uh, constantly keep yourself in check. And uh, so the a good question here would be the relation between an anemic domain model and functional programming. In functional programming, uh, there is a guideline. Well, 
In functional programming, you usually do the programming in, in this way. You, you have um, a class with the data and also a class with operations, with functions that work on top of this data. So here, for example, we have the square class with the single property uh, of the uh, length of its side. And we also have the services class that calculates the area of uh, the square. So a good question here is, is this approach an anemic domain model? Because this approach looks exactly like the approach that the rich domain model advocates against. And the answer to this question is no, it is not an anemic domain model. And that's because here we have uh, another important differentiating factor, and that is immutability. Because we don't need to um, modify we cannot modify the square class, we don't need to worry about data inconsistency. So in functional programming, all data is immutable and all functions that work with this data, they don't modify the existing data. They create new data uh, based on the existing data. And so because of that, because all data is immutable, you, um, functions, well, you as a programmer, don't need to worry about data inconsistency because you can only introduce inconsistencies when you modify this data. And because of that, because there is no need uh, to worry about inconsistencies, there is no need in encapsulation at all. Um, so once again, encapsulation is when you protect data integrity. And you need to do that when you modify your data. But because you're not modifying anything, then you just don't need to worry about this at all. And this removes the whole class of errors uh, related to data inconsistencies. Uh, so yeah, this, this is a good approach. And if we go back to this example, here you can see that the side length is indeed read-only. And the only set of checks that we have here is when we create a square, when we uh, make sure that the length is not, uh, is not equal to or less than zero. And when we create, when we successfully create an instance of this square class, we may be sure that it is not, uh, it is always valid. It always remains consistent and we can freely pass it around without worrying about uh, potential inconsistencies. And here there is a good quote from Michael Feathers in that regard, and that is, object-oriented programming makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. Functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts. And here by moving parts, um, uh, he means exactly the uh, changes of your uh, data. And that's the difference between object-oriented programming and functional programming. Uh, the difference is that in functional programming, you don't need to worry about data modifications at all. And, and by extension, you don't need to worry about encapsulating them. While in object-oriented programming, you do need to worry about them, but only in, again, in, in cases where you do this modification. If your data is read-only, you also don't need to worry about that. So um, in most applications, in most uh, organizations, you already have some pre-existing code. Uh, and this code is often written using the anemic domain model. And a good question here would be, so what exactly can you do to transfer your domain model to refactor it from anemic domain model to a rich domain model. So how can you, in other words, how can you encapsulate your domain model and make it a rich domain model? In order to do so, you need to undertake two steps. The first step is you need to introduce strong typing into your domain model with the help of value objects. And the second step is you need to reduce the number of methods that modify the state of your domain model. So let's discuss these steps uh, uh, separately. <coughs> let's take our customer example again. And here we can see that, for example, the email property is represented as a string. But is this property really a string? It is not because the number of uh, valid emails is smaller than the number of valid strings. And so the concept of email is not the same as the concept of string. And this approach where we uh, use uh, 
primitive types to model our domain is called string typing. Uh, this concept is a play of word on the concept of strong typing, but instead of having separate types for your domain concepts, you are using primitive types such as strings, integers, and so on. And the same is true for the discount property. Here, uh, the uh, concept of decimal is not the same as the concept of a discount because uh, the, uh, the minimum number of, uh, the minimum discount that you may have is zero and the maximum discount, uh, possible discount that you, uh, you may have is 100. But 101, for example, is a perfectly valid uh, number for a decimal, but it's not a valid number for a discount. You cannot have more than a 100% discount. And so uh, you need to refactor your domain model to introduce strong typing to the domain model. Instead of using primitive types such as strings, you need to introduce separate types to represent your domain concepts. So for example, here, instead of a string, you need to have a separate email class or email address class. And those uh, wrapper types, wrapper classes, are called value objects. And let's see how these can be implemented in the customer class. So here is our uh, customer class that uses primitive types. And this is how we can um, refactor it, how we can introduce strong typing to that class. So uh, here we have these three fields that are now using value objects instead of primitive types, email status and discount. And also you may have, um, you may uh, build more complex value objects on top of uh, simpler value objects and this way you will achieve a hierarchy of abstractions in your application. For example, uh, here, uh, uh, it could be the case that the current discount depends on the status of the customer. But because we are, um, we can modify these two properties independently from each other, we may introduce inconsistencies between them when we assign a status, but we forget to assign a new level of the discount. And so instead of that, we can do the following. We can put we can move this responsibility of determining the current discount to the value object itself, to the status value object itself. And this way we will close another potential flaw in our, value, uh, in our domain model where we can have this inconsistency between these two types, between these uh, two attributes, between this, um, the status attribute and the current discount attribute. Now it's simply impossible to have these two attributes uh, uh, inconsistent in our domain model. So that's the first step, the introduction of strong typing in your domain model with the help of value objects. The second step is to reduce the number of methods that modify your domain model. Let's see how this can be done. <clears throat> So this is uh, once again our customer class and this customer class already have some improvements in terms of the strong typing. We can see that it uses not just the primitive type for, for emails, but the email value object St uh, and the same for the status and the discount properties. But uh, there are still some flaws in this class. First of all, um, we have immutable list to represent the uh, collection of orders and we also have the public publicly available publicly available setter for that property so the property itself is also mutable and it means that the customers of that class they are able to do with that collection whatever they want they can for example clear that collection they can set it to null they can insert multiple orders to that collection and um, that again, once again, introduces potential risk for bugs in your application because you need to constantly think of what is and what isn't allowed to do with that class. And here also in the uh, customer service, you may see that this customer service is responsible for an invariant in your domain model. This invariant is that if the number of orders increase uh, becomes larger than 10 then the status of the customer should become advanced and so um, if you have 
the problem with this approach is that if you have multiple places where you add orders to the customer, you may forget to do this check in one of them. And this way you will introduce inconsistency uh, to your domain model. You will introduce a bug. To avoid this situation, uh, to uh, remove these potential uh, for uh, inconsistencies, you need to move that logic, you need to move this logic of adding new orders from services down to the customer entity itself. And this, uh, this is how it will look after the refactoring. So here uh, we can see that we've removed the setters from the name and the email properties. We've made the uh, status, the setter for the status property uh, private, so the clients is, are not able to modify that property. And we also uh, modified our orders at, uh, property. We've made it read only. So, first of all, we've made the uh, type of that order uh, I read only list, which means that the clients will not be able to modify the collection. And we also removed the setter for this uh, attribute for this property so that the client will not be able to nullify, for example, that uh, property. And also we introduced the new method here, the add order method. And this method is now responsible for maintaining its invariant. So this class is now itself responsible for the invariant of uh, maintaining the proper status of the customer. And now the clients of this class are not able to violate this invariant because they will not be able to do, uh, they will not be able to add new orders uh, other th uh, in any way other than to call by calling this add order method. And uh, that's and also note that here in this new uh, class, in this new version of the class, we reduced the number of methods that modify the state of this class. So previously with um, with all the setters and with the mutable orders collection, we have uh, something like five or six places where uh, the clients of this class were able to modify that class. And now with these modifications, we have just one such place, and that is the add order method itself. Other than call by calling this add order method, the clients of this class are not able to modify the state of this class. And uh, also it should be noted, um, there is a good guideline here, and that is, uh, uh, you need to have uh, the clients of your domain classes to achieve a single goal of that client, uh, they should be able to call just one method on that domain class. So one goal, one method. And uh, uh, this is a good rule of thumb that will help you to um, uh, point out the potential uh, lack of encapsulation in your domain model. So if you're here, for example, uh, you can see that the customer service before we refactored our customer class, this service had to do two calls on the customer class. It had to first add the order itself, and then it had to, to do the check and then potentially update the customer status. And now after the modification, we uh, the clients of our class now have to do only one call, the add order uh, method call. And this method will do all these checks on its own. And that's um, uh, that's a sign that we've encapsulated our domain model properly because the clients of the domain model now have to only do one method call to achieve one singular goal. And this goal being here the addition of a new order to the customer. And um, in the end, this guideline, these two steps can be summarized with this pyramid. So here on the pyramid, we have uh, the services on the top of this pyramid, the services such as the customer service. In the middle of this pyramid, we have entities such as the customer entity. And at the bottom of this pyramid, we have value objects such as email status and discount value object. And the guideline here is that you need to move as much logic as possible down this pyramid from services to entities and from entities to value objects. And the reason is that 
value objects are immutable and so because of that they are very easy to work with because of their uh, immutability and if you put domain logic to your value objects that domain logic also becomes easy to work with solely by the fact that uh, value objects are immutable and so you should attribute as much logic as possible to those value objects customers ideally um, they should contain logic that cannot be put into value objects. And customer services should only contain domain logic that cannot logically be put to entities and also logic that is related to out of process dependencies, for example, database or some external systems. <laughs> and with these two steps, with uh, first introducing the, um, and yeah, by the way, uh, so the first step here, uh, uh, introduction of strong typing with the help of value objects is uh, when you move your logic from entities down to value objects from so from the middle of this pyramid to the bottom of this pyramid and the second step when you uh, reduce the number of methods that modify the state of your entities um, with that second step step you are moving your domain logic from services down to entities and with these two steps, you will have a rich encapsulated domain model. And these two steps are enough to achieve high encapsulation um, in your uh, domain model. All right, so that was the second uh, part of the talk. Uh, so we discussed the anemic and a rich domain model. Now let's talk about domain model purity. <laughs> Domain model purity is another important attribute of a good domain model. And to discuss that what domain model purity is, is we need to represent our application with the help of uh, hexagonal architecture. So we can represent our application as a hexagon, hexagon uh, where in the middle of that hexagon, we have uh, this large green circle and that circle is a domain model and everything outside of that circle is the application layer or the infrastructure layer. And with this hexagonal architecture, we may also have some external systems that work with our application. So for example, uh, such an external system may be a client application that calls our API. And it could, um, another external system could be, uh, can be a downstream system. For example, uh, a message bus that we use to send messages to other applications. So that's the hexagonal architecture. There are three important attributes of a, uh, of a hexagonal architecture, and uh, they are, first of all, they are, uh, it is the separation of concerns between the domain model and the application services, the application layer. So what is the separation is all about? Uh, business logic is the most important part of your application. And therefore, the domain layer should be accountable only for that business logic, and it should be exempted from all other responsibilities. Um, so uh, those responsibilities, for example, such as uh, communicating with the external applications or retrieving data from the database, those responsibilities must be attributed to the application layer. And conversely, the application layer shouldn't contain any business logic. The responsibility <clears throat> their responsibility is to adapt the domain layer by translating the incoming requests into operations on those domain classes, on that domain layer, and then persisting the results back um, to the database and maybe um, returning a result to the caller, sending messages to the message bus, and so on. So uh, the responsibility of the uh, application layer is to coordinate the work between your domain model and external systems such as the database and so on. And so you can think of it, of these two layers, as uh, your domain layer is a collection of the application's domain knowledge, whereas the application layer is a set of the business use cases. In other words, um, your application layer knows about the use cases that are present in your application, whereas, but it doesn't know how to implement those use cases, whereas the domain layer no, doesn't know about what use cases there are 
specifically in your application, but it knows how to implement um, uh, different parts of those use cases. So that's the first attribute of a hex uh, hexagonal architecture. It's the separation of concerns between between the domain layer and the application layer. The second attribute is uh, the one-way flow of dependencies between your uh, between these two layers, and this attribute flows from the first one. Uh, the one-way flow of dependencies means that your application layer does depend on the domain layer, but the domain layer doesn't know anything about the application layer. Uh, the classes inside your domain layer should only depend on each other. They shouldn't depend on classes from the application services layer. And as I said, this guideline from, flows from the previous one. <laughs> Um, and finally, the third attribute here is the communication between applications. Um, it means that the external applications should connect to your application only through a common interface that is maintained by the application layer. They shouldn't have direct access to the domain layer. And this property also flows from the first property uh, because, as I said, the application layer is responsible for coordination between the domain layer and the external world. And so uh, the application layer should be the, um, the uh, entry point for all external applications with your system that, that communicate with your system. So let's look an example at an example of when these domain model purity Oh, yeah, and by the way, so why domain model purity is important? Domain model purity is essentially the this uh, is essentially the adherence to this separation of concerns between the domain model and the application services. It means that the, uh, the domain model doesn't need does, shouldn't know about external systems, and uh, you should maintain this purity precisely because your domain model should be exempted from all other responsibilities. The domain model itself is already complex enough. You shouldn't attribute it uh, any additional responsibilities because it will lead to overcomplication of your domain model, and this will in turn lead to uh, additional maintenance overhead. You will not be able to work with your domain model as easily as before. So just you need to make sure that your domain model is only responsible for modeling the domain, nothing else. Everything else is, should, ha should be handled by the application layer. And um, so let's look at an example of when uh, this domain model purity is not maintained. <laughs> so here, for example, we have the customer class that is responsible for saving itself to the database and restoring its state from the database. This pattern is called the active record pattern, and um, uh, it is, it is well, I would say that it is an anti-pattern. Anti it is not a good pattern. So this pattern works pretty well on small projects, but it doesn't scale when, um, when you grow your project. And the reason is exactly the reason that I described previously. It's because this pattern uh, mixes the two responsibilities, the domain logic of your application and the persistent logic. So here, for example, the customer will be responsible for um, maintaining the domain logic related to this customer, and it will also be responsible for, um, uh, for the persistence logic. So you shouldn't try to avoid this pattern. <laughs> And also domain model purity um, uh, is, um, so um, you need to maintain domain model purity, not only in terms of the out of process dependencies that uh, your domain model shouldn't have, but also in terms of uh, volatile, um, uh, volatile dependencies, volatile dependencies, such as, for example, the uh, call to the date now, uh, date time now property. This call also introduces impurity to your domain model because this call is not referentially transparent. Referential transparency is when you can replace a method call with the result of that method call, and this replacement will not change the behavior of your program, of your application. Uh, 
And here, uh, it is not the case because uh, the um, each time you call the time now property, this call will, will return uh, a different result. And so this call is not referentially transparent. And because of that, uh, your uh, add order class is not referentially transparent either. It's not pure. And the same is true if you, let's say, pass not, uh, if you don't just call to um, call the daytime now property, but pass some delegate, some function to this method and call that function instead. It's uh, the same, because it will also be impure because uh, uh, here you, this method call is also not referentially transparent because it will return different result uh, each time you call this method. The only way to maintain domain, um, well, domain model purity here is to pass the uh, the current date and time as a value, not uh, as a function and not call the date time now property, but pass it here as a uh, value. So that was uh, domain model purity. Let's now discuss the relation between these two attributes. <coughs> these two attributes, the uh, domain model encapsulation and domain model purity. It is related in an interesting way, and that's where the DDD trilemma comes into play. So to discuss the trilemma itself, uh, we need to look at an example. So let's say that we have this customer controller that changes uh, the customer email. So it accepts some customer ID and a new email. It then retrieves this customer from the database, changes its email, saves it back to the database and returns that everything is fine to the caller. And now let's say that we have a new requirement in our system. Let's say that we need to uh, maintain email uniqueness in our system. We need to make sure that when we modify the email of our customers, we cannot use the same email twice for two different customers. And uh, how we can do that? So the first approach and the simplest approach is to just add a new check to this controller where we try to find an existing customer by the email, and if that customer indeed exists, we're saying that uh, this email is already taken, so we're returning an error to the caller. So this approach does the work, so it, it does work, but uh, there is a problem here, and the problem is that now we, uh, our domain model is not responsible for all invariants in our domain model. So we now uh, introduced a new invariant, this unique email uh, in, uh, requirement, which is an invariant that all our emails should be unique. And now it is, uh, um, our domain model is not responsible for that, uh, for that new invariant. So the only uh, method on our domain model that we are using here is this change email method. And this method doesn't know anything about uh, this new uh, requirement. So in other words, our domain model is not fully encapsulated anymore. <laughs> so how can we fix that? How can we make our domain model encapsulated? Well, we can inject the customer repository into the change email method and make the customer entity itself be responsible for that invariant. So we can uh, ask this uh, customer, uh, uh, customer entity to do the check on its own. So try to select, try to retrieve the existing customer from the database using this new email. And if it indeed exists, then uh, return an error. And if uh, it doesn't exist, then return a success. And this result class here, it just, um, it's just a uh, wrapper on top of the successfulness of an operation. If it's a success, then we return the result dot success, and if it's a failure, then we return the result dot failure. So now our domain model is responsible for that new invariant, and here is how the controller looks. Uh, here we don't do anything aside from calling this change email method, and so the controller is not responsible for that. Uh, invariant. In, in other words, um, uh, our domain model is now fully encapsulated. But the problem with this approach is that our domain model is not 
pure anymore. So we've introduced a new dependency to our domain model, the dependency on the customer repository. And this dependency means that um, our domain model, our customer class is now dependent on the out of process dependency on the database. So um, a common um, a common approach here would be to say, uh, well, let's just replace the customer repository with an iCustomer repository interface, and that would solve the problems with the domain model impurity. But no, that will not uh, solve anything because there is actually no difference between customer repository and the iCustomer repository. It's just um, uh, both of them are an explicit reference to the database. And by explicit reference, I mean that uh, if you, well, suppose you don't have a database in your application and your domain model and your application doesn't need to store anything in that database and doesn't need to retrieve anything from that database. So all you have, all data that you have, you store that data in the memory. In this case, you will not need a customer repository and you will also not need an i customer repository interface because you will be able to just pass all your existing customers as a collection to the uh, customer uh, method you will not need to uh, pass any abstractions to that method such as an i customer repository interface and so both of these um, uh, versions customer repository and i customer repository they both introduce an impurity to your domain model because they, they both are an explicit dependency on the database. And that brings us to the DDD Trilemma. This is how it looks. So <clears throat> the Trilemma itself tells us that we cannot achieve all three properties in our application. We can only achieve two of them at the expense of the third one. So uh, the three par properties here being domain model encapsulation, domain model purity, and application performance. So what options do we have here? So what combinations can we uh, implement uh, when, we, uh, when we design our, our application? So the first option here would be to inject out of process dependencies directly into the domain model. And that's the option with the customer repository or the iCustomer repository interface. This approach gives us domain model encapsulation, it gives us performance, but it uh, gives up domain model purity because now our domain model becomes impure. The second approach here is to split the decision-making process between the domain layer and the controllers. And that's the first approach that we have, we had when we uh, put this check into the controller directly, when the controller checked for the email uniqueness. And this approach gives us domain model purity because now the domain model doesn't need to uh, uh, work with, doesn't need to work with the database. It gives us performance but it does it at, at the expense of domain model encapsulation. And finally, the third approach here is this. We can push all external reads and writes to the edges of the business operation. So in the example with the modification of the customer email, what we could do to preserve both domain model purity and encapsulation, uh, we could um, we could retrieve all the customers from the database and then uh, pass all those customers to the change email method. And so the uh, change email method would check for those um, uh, customers on its own. By the way, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Uh... Yep. Okay. Good. So, so uh, the customer entity will use this collection of customers to check for email uniqueness between among those customers. But, uh, uh, but of course, that would bring um, uh, that would be um, highly uh, inefficient solution because it will uh, well you will have to uh, retrieve all your customers on each uh, email modification, which is not practical. But still, uh, there are cases when you can do that, but when you can give up some level, some degree of performance for the uh, for the encapsulation and domain model purity. It's just not always possible. 
So which approach to choose here between these three properties, between these three properties and between these three approaches? I would recommend that you follow this guideline. So if you can give up performance, uh, you should do that because both domain model purity and domain model encapsulation are important. And if you give up some level of performance uh, to the benefit of these two properties, then you, sh you should definitely do that. If it's not possible uh, for some reason, and if um, uh, let's say uh, your uh, requirements are, uh, uh, by your requirements, you cannot give up uh, performance, then you will have to choose between domain model purity and domain model encapsulation. And in this case, I recommend that you choose purity over encapsulation. And that's because um, the, the lack of encapsulation is a lesser evil compared to the lack of purity. Um, so if you uh, give up domain model purity, it means that you will have to put additional responsibilities to your domain model. Uh, and as I said, Previously, your domain model is the most important part of your application, and it should only be responsible for modeling your domain. If you put additional responsibilities to your domain model, then it would mean that uh, your uh, well, uh, you will over overcomplicate your application, your domain model, and it will it will make it harder to work with. The uh, the Encapsulation, domain model encapsulation is also important, but it's not as important as domain model purity. And it's interesting that it's not only um, domain driven design that advocates to do this choice between domain model purity and encapsulation, but also functional programming and unit testing. They also advocate uh, for that choice. Functional programming chooses this approach, it chooses purity over encapsulation because it's the only way to make your functions pure. Functional programming is all about referential transparency, transparency and uh, domain and um, purity. It's all about the avoidance of hidden inputs and outputs in the uh, domain model of your application, such as, for example, uh, querying the database, um, that would be one of, uh, of the examples of a hidden input. And unit testing also advocates for the uh, for purity over encapsulation because pure domain model means <coughs> testable domain model. It means that uh, you will be able to test your domain model without uh, setting up complicated mocks, uh, stops without need, the need to check the interactions between them. The, your testing, uh, your tests will become much uh, simpler, and the testing process will become much more simple. All right, so that's um, uh, that was the TDD trilemma. So uh, let's do a quick summary. We discussed the main principles of domain driven design. Once again, they are. Uh, bounded context, ubiquitous language, and the focus on the domain model. Then we discussed the anemic and rich domain model. You can uh, refactor your anemic domain model into a rich domain model uh, using two steps. First, you need to introduce strong typing with the help of value objects. And second, you need to remove, you need to move all the logic, as much of it as possible, uh, from services to entities. And this way you will be able to re uh, reduce the number of methods that modify the state of your domain model. And we also discussed the domain model purity. It's um, the domain model uh, is pure in so far it doesn't refer to out of process dependencies such as um, uh, the database and it doesn't matter how exactly it refers to it directly or indirectly through an interface and we also discussed the connection between an encapsulated domain model and a pure domain model that's where the ddd trilemma comes into play and in that uh, connection i recommend that you choose purity over encapsulation and uh, if you can, you should choose both purity and encapsulation over performance. But again, it's not always possible, but sometimes it is. All right, that's basically it. So once again, um, this is the link to my DDD courses on Plural site. I also read, uh, wrote a series of articles about DDD Trilemma that you can view using this link. 
And this is my uh, unit testing book. We can uh, proceed to questions if you have any. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vladimir, uh, for your talk. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the practical examples uh, around the, the different concept, concepts you presented uh, from DDD. Uh, as you mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll try to move to the Q&A session uh, for which we're going to, to take up questions the, the audience has for you. So I'll, uh, I'll go first. So uh, what is the accepted or acceptable level of duplication when defining the, the bounded contexts? How does this comply with static uh, analysis tools like uh, SonarCube or, yeah? Um, so um, the, basically with bounded contexts, we have this uh, trade-off between, um, let me move back a little bit. And this one. <clears throat> so with bounded context, we have a trade off between the dry principle, the don't repeat yourself principle and uh, the principle of uh, loose coupling. Uh, you will not be able to have both of them because if you duplicate your um, classes, domain classes between bounded context, you will not be able to achieve dryness, so to speak. Uh, but on the other hand, if you achieve dryness, if you uh, reuse the code, you will not be able to achieve uh, loose coupling between the uh, the code, uh, between the bounded contexts. I wouldn't say that there is any uh, acceptable level of uh, duplication because once again, uh, duplication here is fine because these bounded contexts look at the same uh, con concept, for example, customer concept from different angles, even if they have some intersections in them, for example, if they have some methods that are needed for both co uh, bounded contexts or they have some attributes that are required for both bounded contexts, even then it's a lesser evil if you uh, separate, completely separate these two classes into their own representations uh, and duplicate some common pieces between them. Because uh, uh, the opposite choice when you reuse these uh, methods, it's a, a much worse trade-off. It provides a much worse set of trade-offs because now you're not able to, um, to develop your bounded contexts in isolation from each other. You will, be, you will need to, for example, if uh, you have in your if you, in your organization you have one team that works on the sales context and another team that works on the support context, they will not be able to modify their uh, respective customer entities. Well, the customer entity you will have just one customer entity. You, they will not be able to modify that entity independently from each other. You you will have to constantly communicate um, uh, between these two uh, teams, and that slows down the development process a lot. And so that uh, I don't recommend that you do that. Um, you should try to um, try to uh, make sure that you have as few such intersections as possible, but it's rarely possible to avoid all intersections between your bounded context. You will almost always have some of them, but even, even in uh, those intersections, you shouldn't avoid uh, duplication because as I said, the, uh, the alternative to this code duplication is much worse. It's basically uh, inability to work, to evolve your software uh, quickly enough. Um, so yeah, that's. Um, I hope that answer makes sense. Yep, thank you. Uh, so moving on to to the next question, uh, what's your preferred approach when it comes to reporting over multiple bounded contexts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there is no one solution that fits all um, all applications. So what could be done here? Uh, well, the most obvious solution is to just uh, have the reporting tool that has access to uh, all of those bounded contexts, have, has access to the databases of all of those bounded contexts. That's one approach. Another approach is 
uh, to provide some API uh, for that reporting tool that would provide the necessary um, uh, necessary uh, well uh, functionality so that the reporting tool can combine all those data into one stream and uh, do whatever it wants to do with that and the third approach here is to have um, is to integrate with this reporting bounded context. So uh, you may have this reporting functionality as a separate bounded context to your existing bounded context, and you may integrate with the existing bounded context. So <clears throat> this reporting tool may subscribe to the uh, events from the existing bounded context and may update its records uh, for uh, uh, well, let's say, for example, if the customer modify, if you modify the customer name or the customer email, uh, you should publish this event. Uh, let's say customer info changed or customer personal info changed, and this reporting bounded context should subscribe to that event and then um, uh, update its records. And this way, you will be able to maintain uh, the decoupling between the two. That would introduce quite a lot of overhead, and this overhead is uh, is justified in a lot of cases, but not in all cases. In some cases, you can just uh, go to the database, to, to the respective databases directly, um, and that sounds awful, but it's not as awful as it sounds because the reporting tool it doesn't, it shouldn't modify anything in uh, in those bounded contexts. For example, the reporting tool does, shouldn't modify anything in the sales bounded context and in the support bounded context. It should only uh, query the respective data to uh, build some uh, reporting tool, uh, re reporting data. And the situation here is the same as in um, encapsulation and in, uh, functional programming. As we discussed previously, Functional programming is different. So uh, functional programming is not about anemic domain models because uh, there is a big differentiating factor between um, uh, domain model in functional programming and in regular OP application. And that is immutability. Functional programming doesn't modify anything in the existing data. And so you shouldn't encapsulate uh, uh, that uh, well, you, you, you don't need to um, you don't need to en encapsulate anything because there is no modifications. And the same is for the reporting tool, uh, because the reporting tool doesn't modify anything. It only queries the data from the existing bounded contexts, and uh, it, it's not as awful to provide this reporting tool direct access to those databases. You just need to make sure that this reporting tool, uh, this reporting bounded context, doesn't ind um, indeed doesn't modify anything in those databases, because that would be awful, because that reporting tool will be able to introduce inconsistencies to your domain model. But if that access is read-only, then uh, it's it's still depends on the project on the case by case. I would evaluate um, the possibility of this approach on a case by case basis, but it's still uh, a feasible option in some cases. So um, yeah, so basically the choice here is between uh, providing access to the database directly or uh, subscribing to um, to the messages from the upstream bounded contexts and updating the uh, separate database in this reporting bounded context. The second approach that I described where you um, provide separate APIs for that reporting tool, it's usually not as efficient because uh, you are not able to um, to select a lot of data with those APIs and uh, those APIs usually are not required because they uh, don't modify anything um, and you can just go directly to the database for that purpose. So yeah, uh, it, in most cases, once again, you will have to subscribe, uh, uh, you, you will have to maintain complete separation between the reporting bounded context by uh, integrating it uh, with the upstream bounded context using uh, something like a message bus, but in some cases you can provide this reporting uh, bounded context with the direct access to uh, the databases, but just make sure that it's a read-only access. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you for the uh, for the answer. And uh, before moving moving for, further to to the next questions, I would also like to thank you, Vladimir, for the uh, informations and for sharing the uh, yeah, the information with us. Uh, so the next question that we have, in theory, if you model an application with domain driven design, can you match the domain models with actors from the actor model? And as an example, we have um, aka.net. Yeah, uh, you can do that. Yes, the actor model um, can be aligned with um, the domain modeling uh, with the DDD principles pretty pretty well. So in DDD, there is this pattern called aggregate, where it's when you uh, aggregate, when you combine several entities into one structure and treat the structure as a single piece, as a single unit. Uh, and so in the actor model, a single actor would be this uh, instance of an aggregate. And um, uh, that's, it's actually interesting to look at the actor model from the perspective, from the microservices architecture perspective. So I, I uh, showed previously that, um, that uh, this, approach when you have multiple executables, multiple deployables per bounded context is uh, anti-pattern because it's a, well, I call it distributed monolith. Um, and it is still true for most cases, but in the actor model, it's not uh, true because um, uh, you are able to maintain, uh, so those separate actors, they act um, as separate microservices in a way in some sense. Um, but uh, those microservices are much smaller than uh, regular sized microservices. They, they, are, they don't um, uh, encompass the whole bounded context. They only encompass, encompass uh, a single aggregate instance. And that is fine in the actor model because you have a rich infrastructure that helps you maintain uh, such a division. So you don't need to, uh, you don't need to let's say, uh, maintain the communication between different actors on its own, the infrastructure itself uh, handles that for you. It has the inbound uh, message queue uh, and um, you basically don't need to worry about that. So um, that's the relation between the microservices and the actor model. Uh, basically, you can view uh, actors as small microservices, but uh, those microservices don't include the whole bounded context that they only include one aggregate instance. And it's also interesting to look at the actor model, not only as from the perspective of the microservices architecture, but also from the perspective of <clears throat> object-oriented programming. So the original idea of object-oriented programming was that you have um, different separate aisles, so to speak, of code that communicate with each other. And what um, what we have now as the object-oriented software uh, in languages like C++, C Sharp, and Java, it's not the original idea that um, that was proposed as the uh, object-oriented programming. The original idea was exactly the same as the actor model is right now. So uh, when there are some aisles of code, those aggregates, and they communicate with each other using some, um, with the help of some infrastructure. So it's also interesting to look at the actor model from this perspective, where it goes, it basically goes back to the original idea of the OP as it was introduced. I think it was Michael Kay, or um, I forgot his name. Um, so yeah, um, I hope this answers your question. Yes. <laughs> And thank you for, for the answer again. Uh, the next one, uh, is it safe to say that active record is a technical pattern and it's okay to use it inside your repository implementation? And as a short remark, it says that essentially your active record entities are not your domain entities. Well, in the actor pattern, in, in the actor rect, uh, record pattern, they are because uh, this pattern is explicitly about um, uh, this responsibility where where you combine the domain entity with two 
uh, with two responsibilities, saving itself to the database and retrieving its state from the database. So it is um, uh, explicitly, well, by definition, this pattern is about combining the domain model with the persistence logic, domain logic and persistence logic. Um, well, again, uh, you wouldn't be able to use it inside your uh, repos repository. Well, I think what you're referring to is the persistence model when, when you have two different classes, one for the domain model, for example, uh, let's say it's customer, and the other one for the persistence uh, layer, uh, let's say customer DB entity or customer uh, data access layer, something like that. So that's a perfectly valid pattern, yes. Uh, so you will need to do the mapping between the two <coughs> when you retrieve uh, your entities from the database and when you save your entities to the database, you pass your customer entity to the repository and then this repository will do the mapping between the customer and the customer DB entity and then save the DB entity uh, to the database. Yes, that's a perfectly valid pattern, but it's not an active record pattern. Yep. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, this question uh, refers to uh, ensuring uh, immutability inside uh, for our around the, the value objects. So uh, the question goes like, uh, how do you balance ensuring immutability in your uh, domain model uh, with reflection, especially when it comes to using third party libraries like uh, object relational mappers? that need uh, a public parameterless constructor? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so <clears throat> you need to balance it in a way um, in the following way. So you wouldn't, you will not be able to make your entities uh, immutable because of uh, ORMs such as Entity Framework or in Hibernate. Uh, you will need to make them mutable even if you have uh, setters. Um, uh, it, well, you can make them immutable for the client of your code. So um, uh, by making the setters on the properties private or protected, that you can do. But you cannot. You will not be able to remove those setters altogether because they will be needed by uh, the ORM. Um, so yeah, the balance here is to make sure that your domain. Um, your value objects are immutable and uh, push all the mutability, all the mutable operations up to the entities. Um, so uh, there is a separate question of how well our ORMs in .NET support value objects. Uh, it's a holy, um, it's such a debatable topic, a holy, holy war topic. Uh, I would say in entity framework, there are. Um, it's not a good uh, entity framework. Doesn't support value objects very well. It does support value objects um, uh, when those value objects have just a single property. And I think it, this feature is called value conversions or something like that. But it doesn't support. Well, it, it does support multi-property value object, but it doesn't support them very well. It's called owned types in entity framework and while it does support them it doesn't um, it doesn't uh, actually uh, implement them as value objects so for example when you use owned types in entity framework entity framework treats that value object as an entity and um, and, and that manifests itself uh, in a way that entity framework creates uh, an id property in that uh, value object. Even though that ID property is hidden, it creates a shadow property with this ID property. And that entails some uh, drawbacks. And, uh, for example, you um, uh, the entity, th there were a lot of those drawbacks in versions before 3.0, but uh, starting from the 3.0, they fixed some of them, but they um, some of them have remained. Um, have a separate article on that topic that discusses the drawbacks of this value object support in entity framework. Uh, and Hibernate in that sense is much better because it doesn't impose this uh, 
artificial restriction, it doesn't introduce any IDs to your value objects and it treats them as value objects, as, as genuine value objects, as part of your entity. Um, so yeah, um, the support of your value objects will vary depending on the ORM, but it still can be done, uh, can be done in most cases. Yep, uh, thank you for uh, for the answer. Uh, up next, we we have a, a, a tricky question. Let's say for you, Vladimir. I, I'm I'm honestly curious how how you're going to to reply to to this one. So uh, the question goes like this: Are functional pro functional programming languages like F# -sharp, for instance better suited for uh, DDD than object oriented languages? <laughs> yeah, um, well, hmm, let's say, let's see. So there are two <clears throat> properties in functional programming that does make them um, better suited for domain driven design. And if you read the book by Scott Flushing. Um, I forgot the title of the book, but it's something about the uh, domain driven design with functional programming, where he shows how you can model your domain using F sharp, using basically a strong typing. So the first property that helps a lot with, um, uh, helps you a lot is immutability. It's out of the box immutability. Um, so you are able to, May, uh, make a lot of your code immutable, at least uh, a lot of your domain code, um, the code inside of your domain model immutable. And yes, it does help because as I said, you're able to maintain your um, encapsulation, uh, well, data consistency uh, with with more um, more easily because you're um, you don't need to worry about data modification. But that's not the only uh, bene beneficial part here. The other um, quite significant benefit is the presence of union types in uh, languages like F Sharp. It's when you uh, model your domain. <coughs> well, um, so how can I better describe it? So uh, a, a simple, a, a typical class is something like something that can be called uh, attribute multiplication. It's when you, for example, have a customer with, um, well, let's open our customer, for example. Yeah, so it's when you have a customer class and this customer class has name and email. And uh, these two properties can have any possible combinations among them. And that's uh, what is called uh, attribute multiplication. So basically the uh, all the possible number of states in the name uh, property is multiplied by the all possible uh, uh, the, the number of all possible states of the email and that will give you the type customer. Uh, what union types give you is it gives you uh, attribute summation. So it's not uh, the multiplication, but the sum of attributes. It's when you can uh, describe that your um, your attribute, your um, uh, your type can be either uh, some uh, ha can have uh, either uh, one uh, value or another, but not both of them. And here I um, actually have a picture, a nice picture of it on one of my articles. In one of my articles, let me find it real quick. That sh it, it, it is very well suited to this question, this particular question. <laughs> Uh, so you should see, can you see the article? Yep, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, here I uh, described the benefits of the functional approach when it comes to domain modeling. And uh, with the regular OP approach, when you have, for example, user status, and this status uh, it might be active, deleted, and when the user status is deleted, it has a deletion date and when it's active, uh, it has the subscriptions. And so uh, in C Sharp, what you usually do is you, um, uh, you implement, well, 
you remove uh, uh, inconsistencies using guard statements. So for example, when you um, delete a user, you make sure that its status is active. And so you cannot delete a user unless its status is active. And when you undelete a user, you need to make sure that its status is deleted. Um, add subscription also is deleted. Uh, um, status should also be active. And so what you have here is this um, <coughs> uh, Cartesian product of all possible states between uh, attributes of the user and also the possible actions upon this user. So for example, uh, the name of the user is applicable to users, to both active and deleted users. Deletion date is only applicable to deleted users, subscriptions to active users. Uh, the method delete and add subscription are applicable to only active users and undelete to only deleted users. So that's uh, the usual approach with C sharp. In F sharp, you are able to do it in, um, in a much easier way, so to speak. So you're able to represent your active user as a separate type as well as your deleted user as a separate type and only uh, in, uh, provide uh, the uh, properties that are applicable to that uh, specific status of the user. So active user may have a name and it has the list of subscriptions, but it doesn't have a deletion date. On the other hand, the deleted user has deletion date, but it doesn't have any subscriptions. And so the user itself can be either active or deleted. And that's what I call uh, that's what it what is called the union um, types. And that's the sum uh, the sum the, uh, the sum of possible states of this user. And uh, this is um, beneficial because uh, you are able to implement specific functions on uh, on the specific types only for the specific types of this user. So you can delete. Um, uh, you're able to delete. Well, uh, you're able to define the delete method in a way that it only accepts active users. It doesn't accept deleted users. And so if you try to delete an already deleted user, you will have a compilation error. So you will basically not be able to uh, even compile the code. And so the picture here for the functional programming would be that instead of this Cartesian product of possible states and um, and methods, we have these two separate uh, um, uh, classes or types with only those members that make sense for that uh, particular state of the user. And here is a good uh, representation of that, um, uh, of that concept. So with the C-sharp approach, when we try to model some um, state, for example, this state, we have to use a more crude approach and then um, and then make sure with the guard statements that the illegal states are not possible to do. Whereas in F sharp, we are able to model, we're able to use the type system such that the illegal states are not even representable. So they are illegal. Your your uh, application wouldn't even compile if you try to uh, delete an already deleted user. So that's the benefit of uh, uh, functional programming languages like F sharp compared to C sharp. Um, so going back to the original question of whether um, uh, functional well F sharp is more suited for domain driven design than C sharp. Yes, in, mo is in, in most cases it is, so I do agree with that statement. Um, I think the only reason why uh, we're still using C-sharp and not F-sharp is because, just because uh, it's more entrenched, C-sharp is more entrenched than F-sharp and it's hard to move the company from uh, the widely known C-sharp to the use of F-sharp, even though this move is beneficial in a lot of cases. And even though you can use them in combination with each other, you can use, for example, F-sharp to model your domain, and then you can orchestrate that domain with all your other pieces um, uh, with uh, using C sharp. So that's basically uh, will be two um, projects in your solution. One is written using F sharp and the other one is written in C sharp and you can consume code written in F sharp from the code written in C sharp. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Okay, thanks once again for the for the answer. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time, but I hope we can fit in um, two questions. Um, the first one of them is about uh, mostly about uh, data consistency, and is like this: Who is in charge of the pro pro of propagating changes between duplicated DB tables, the one that you shown in the previous uh, in the first slides, practically? and if there are any moments of inconsistency. Right, um, so um, the bounded context should be in charge of that. So here the communication between bounded context should be uh, using uh, a message bus. So some asynchronous uh, communication mechanism, which is usually a message bus. So you, the support context shouldn't go directly to the sales context database and shouldn't just query uh, the data from the data uh, uh, from its database directly. It should um, because once again, uh, the database is should be private for the particular bounded context for the particular microservice. Um, and they should only communicate using the APIs, uh, using data contracts. And here the data contract is not the database. The data contract is the structure of the messages that you put on the message bus, that these bounded contacts put on the message bus. And so, yeah, uh, the integration here is basically um, the way you would do the integration between, um, uh, the way you would normally do the integration between different microservices. And that's usually using um, a message bus such as uh, SNS in AWS um, or uh, service bus in Azure, um, uh, queues in Azure, so something like that. Okay, and the last question, uh, if we have multiple bounded contexts inside the monolith, what is the recommended way to separate them at the code level? And if this separation applies also to the application layer as well? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, it, it should, yes. So the separation should be uh, done in a way, well, as if you are deploying those bounded contexts into separate executables, into separate applications, separate microservices. So uh, the structure shouldn't really uh, differ that much between your microservices architecture and your modular monolith. So um, in the code, it would look like um, it shouldn't, your bounded context shouldn't all um, remain in the same project. So for example, you shouldn't have uh, the domain model for both of your bounded contacts in, in a single uh, solution project. You should have them separated into different projects and not only in the domain model, but also the application layer. So usually it looks like, um, well, let's say that you have two layers, the application layer, the domain layer, well, and let's say you have the infrastructure layer. Um, so the application layer is usually the API that um, uh, encompasses, that adapts your domain layer. And um, you will have these three or two uh, projects for each of your bounded contexts. So you will have the application layer for the sales context and the domain layer for the sales context as a, as a separate project. And you will also have the application layer as a separate project for the support context and for the domain uh, model. So um, this way you will be able to maintain the uh, the uh, uh, boundaries between your domain, uh, between your bounded contexts uh, more easily compared to if you just keep them all in a single uh, project. Okay, thanks for all of your answers. Um, and this is how we concluded our uh, Q&A session. Uh, I want to thank you all for being with us. We really hope that you have enjoyed the talk with uh, Vladimir. Me personally, I've uh, enjoyed it. And don't forget about the, the third track of Centric Tech Events uh, 2021, when, where you'll discover the dark secrets and nightmares of uh, UX and how to fix them with uh, our speaker, Vitaly Friedman. Have a nice evening and see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye bye guys. Bye.